Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity again to share your word. I ask that you think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, none of me but all of you. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in, in your sight. Open up the eyes of understanding. Let the entrance of your word bring light. I thank you that faith increases because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as a result of what we hear today, we'll never be the same again. That thank you, Lord God, that we will be edified and the devil will be terrified. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, clap to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords again. Amen. Come on, let's, let's thank God for this wonderful worship team. I'm going to have to get you all over the right direction. Come on, come on. We thank God for them. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. So grateful to be here again. And uh, God is good. I, I, I kept waiting. He uh, chaplain down and introduced me yesterday. He kept saying, young man. And I kept waiting for him to hear it again. He didn't say it this morning. I don't, I don't, maybe I aged between yesterday and today. He said it about four times when I got up yesterday. And that, that young man is really important to me right now because in a couple of days I'm about to be 60. So I did, so can, 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 can y'all look at me and say, preach young man, preach young. Oh, stop it, you're, make, you're making me blush. So glad to be here and uh, thank God for Kenneth Copeland Ministries that has changed lives around the world. Amen. And uh, thank God for Chaplain Downing in, uh, even in hosting this meeting. You know, when I first came to this city in 1995, uh, someone said that uh, noted preachers didn't come to this city. And they said, and I said, well, why is that? And they said, well, the word is out on Columbia. I said, well, what's the word on Columbia? I just got here. They said that Columbia doesn't meet the budget. Well, thank God that's changed. I said, thank God that's changed. Amen. And so as a result of, uh, of, of our ministry and people like, like, uh, like uh, Chaplain Downing, we're able to host great meetings like this with great generals in the body of Christ. Come on, let's thank God again for this meeting. All right. Well, let's go right. I, let, let me go to work. Colossians, the first chapter, verse 12 and 13. Colossians, the first chapter, verses 12 and 13. And while you're turning there, just listen to this. 2 Timothy 1.11, it says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Um, I recently just found myself in the scriptures so through that verse right there. 2 Timothy 1.11, somebody said, was he a preacher or was he a teacher? I don't know because I... I like preaching. Somebody else said, well, I like teaching. Well, the scripture says here, and, and so I claim what, what, what God said to Paul. He said, I'm appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. And by apostle, the Lord sent me here to this city. Apostle means a sent one. The Lord sent me here to this city 26 years ago. Our ministry just celebrated 25 years this year. I wasn't planning on being here. You heard uh, uh, Chaplain Downing say that he's a Southern, uh, a country boy. I am the extreme opposite of a country boy. I am from Jersey City, New Jersey, born and raised in the projects. Uh, we got a house when I was 17 years old and it had some dirt on the side of it, which was about 50 feet by four feet. And I thought we were living on a farm. I tried to plant everything I could because uh, I, I wanted to have a garden. And, uh, you know, we had, a, we had a pond in our city. Lincoln Park had a pond. And uh, we used to call that pond the lake. <laughs> now I'm down south, I know what a lake, I said, now I know, that was a pond. And so I had no plans of being here, but I obeyed God at the Marriott Hotel here. I was praying about a corporate job I came here to interview for. The Lord told me how much money they're gonna give me and take the job. He said, but I'm bringing you here to start a ministry. I said, no, 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 no. No, 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 you must be me talking to God next door. I'm not planning on staying here in Columbia, South Carolina. I don't know anything about the South. The only thing I know about the South is what I've seen on TV when I watch movies like Roots <laughs> and Mississippi Burning. And um, I'm not the one. But I'm so glad I obeyed God. 
and God has blessed us and blessed our, my family and my ministry. And so Columbia, South Carolina ha is our wealthy place. Uh, Columbia, South Carolina has been our Jehovah Jireh, the place that our provision has been seen. And can I tell you this for all of you who are trying to make your own life and, and determine your own way, the best place to be is in the will of God. I know you got great plans for your life, where you want to go and what you want to do, but the Bible says that he determines beforehand uh, our appointed times in the bounds of our habitation, which means where we're supposed to live. Just because we're talking about soldiers and we're soldiers in the army of the Lord and no soldier decides where he's going to be stationed. He's sent and, and deployed based upon the assignment. And so we need to be in the will of God. I also want to greet, even before I read the script, I want to greet all those who are watching us on KCM.org and all those watching by Facebook and, and uh, however else you're watching. Thank God for you because this is, this is a day that we, many times we have more people watching us around the world who are not in the room, even than those who are in the room. So let's thank God for all those that are watching. On behalf of, of Kenneth Copeland Ministries, thank you for tuning in. Colossians first chapter, uh, verse 12 and 13, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. That verse 13 is where I want to, want to highlight as our foundational scripture that God has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And I want to speak briefly today because I got, I got to move. <laughs> um, I want to speak from the subject, from the subject, the kingdom advantage. Everyone say to me, say the kingdom advantage. Some of us have heard the term or heard the phrase, it was the best of times and the worst of times. Many of us heard that and we don't know exactly where that comes from, but that phrase has been taken from the famous opening paragraph of Charles Dickens' novel, A Tale of Two Cities. And the novel opens up with, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the age, it was the epic of belief, and it was the epic of incredulity. And this, and that, that passage from Charles Dickens' uh, novel suggests an age of radical opposites taking place across the English Channel. In France, on one side, in the United Kingdom, Great Britain, respectively on the other side. And it tells the story of contrasts and comparisons between London and Paris during the French Revolution. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. It was wisdom, time of wisdom was also time of foolishness. And likewise, whenever negative things and the worst things are happening in our world, in our countries, in our cities, in the political arena, it can be the worst of times and yet the best of times. For the believer who has been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Can you say this with me? Say, I'm in the kingdom now. Oh, glory to God, glory to God. I'm so glad that I found out about kingdom benefits. For some reason, I kept thinking today, Brother Copeland wrote a book many years ago that, that changed my life, and it was real profound at the time. It was called um, uh, God's Mutual Funds. And it changed my life because at the time, we didn't have, I didn't have mutual funds, it was just God's funds. Tell me y'all get that later. Uh, I didn't have any, so it was just God's funds, but I wanted to get in on that mutual part. So I read that and it changed my life to understand that because I'm in the kingdom of God, there's certain rights and privileges and benefits that I have that go beyond me being an American citizen, that go beyond me being an African American, that beyond, go beyond me being a city boy or a country boy. I'm in the kingdom now, glory to God. And so despite the worst of times for the world, it can be the best of times for the believer. 
Now, everyone's not telling us this, but most, at least most of the people who I'm talking to, who are pastors and over ministries, it, it's amazing people that when we were, with some people initially were concerned that the church would suffer economically, the church has gone to another level in the pandemic. Now, everybody's not going to tell you that, okay, but, but that's the truth. Okay. As a matter of fact, we were getting ready to build, we were getting ready to build a, a, a new church and our bank partner uh, uh, said to us, said to us, said, well, well we're, we're just going to hold off right now. We're just going to hold off. As things change in, in the midst of the pandemic, they said, we're going to hold off. He said, because we need to see how the economy does. We need to see how the bank does and we need to see how your church does. And I told, my, I told the vice president of the bank sitting there in my office at the church, I said, well, I'll be praying for the economy and praying for the bank. I said, the church, we're going to be all right. <laughs> I reminded him of that as we're getting ready probably in the next 30, 60 days to, to break ground. And the bank is more excited than we are. Okay. But they don't have to, they don't have the right to be excited because, because we, because we get in, we get right out. Okay. Okay. Okay, I, I, I've learned how to use this system without this system using me. I get in, I get right out. Before they can make money off, it was paid off. <laughs> Glory to God. And so I discovered that because we're in the kingdom, when other people are suffering, we can still be thriving. When other folks are barely surviving, we are thriving. When other folks are going down, we're still going up. When other folks are frowning, we can still be smiling. We have the kingdom advantage. Jesus was always contrasting the kingdom of this world from the kingdom of God. He was always contrast, con contrasting his kingdom from the natural kingdom. They said, him, are, are you a king? Well, if you're king, where's your kingdom? And he says in John 18 and 36, and he answered, John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. He said, I want to let you know something. If my kingdom was of this world, y'all would be gone. This would be over before it started. <laughs> my, then my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence or not from here. John 16, 33. This, I can just get stuck right here. John 16, 33, Jesus said this, these things have I spoken unto you that in me, in me, you might have peace. Now in the world, you're going to have tribulation. You can catch that. But in me, you won't have peace. Now in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But in me, you're going to have peace. It's the worst of times in the world because you got tribulation. But you got the best of times in me because you got peace. Are y'all listening to me? Jesus was, con was contrasting kingdoms. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But in me, you have peace. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. All the trouble that the world is going through, I already knew about it before it ever happened, and I've already given you the victory. I, I know this may be a surprise to us, but God is not up in heaven saying, well, Mike, what are we going to do now? I just never saw this pandemic coming and and whether it came from a, from a, from a laboratory in, in China or came from a rat that bit somebody, bit a banana and they ate the banana, I, 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 I don't know. What are we going to do? How are my people going to make it? How are we going to continue to thrive? Well, maybe let's not build a church now because I never saw this coming. I even heard somebody preaching and teaching something saying, you know, that tithes and offerings is an antiquated uh, 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 financial method because the church can't survive today of tithes and offering because when, tithe, when, when that was written, the church didn't have mortgages and didn't, and didn't have staff. And, and I said, the Lord said to me that, all right. And so it's not like God writes his words. Oh my goodness, I didn't think about that. I need to write a new Bible for the 21st century because this stuff is antiquated. No, everything we're going through, God already has a plan. Come on, he was in the beginning before the beginning began to begin. He's 
he's already established the ending from the beginning, with Lithi means the ending at the beginning. Okay, I'm going deep on you now. God never lets us start what he hasn't already finished. Let me tell this side. God never lets us start what he hasn't already finished. He who has begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it and bring it to a flourishing conclusion because we are in the kingdom. So no matter what's going on in the natural economy, no matter what's going on with airborne viruses, no matter what's going on with corporate America, no matter what's going on with Washington, D.C., or the political arena, you know, it's really, it, it just amazed me, the people who got despondent, oh, like, they, like it's all over because the person they wanted got in the office or the person they didn't want get, didn't get in the office. We are in the kingdom. I will lift my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. Oh my God, oh Jesus, I promise I wouldn't say this, but I gotta say it. I was thriving under Democratic administrations. I'm gonna thrive under Republican administration. I was thriving under Republicans. I, 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 will, I will thrive under Democrat because my God supplies all my need according to his riches in glory and I'm always gonna be all right. The church is always gonna be all right, but we got to keep our eyes on him. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Ah. We got the advantage over the world. When Joseph brought his family down to Egypt, talking about the, 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 the Joseph who was the son of Jacob, when Joseph brought his family down to Egypt, they didn't just live in Egypt. Catch this, they lived in Goshen in Egypt. Let me say this again. They didn't just live in Egypt, they lived in Goshen in Egypt. Look at Genesis 47 and six. After Joseph caused the land to flourish, and to thrive because the revelation that God gave him about how to preserve the land economically through the seven years of famine and the seven years of prosperity and how to prepare for it, which means simply, y'all, don't spend all your money. Okay, see, yeah, I, I saw teach about economics. You know, people always talk about, talk about the prodigal son and how, how bad it got for the prodigal son. The problem with the prodigal son was it wasn't a famine. The problem with the prodigal son is that he, when he spent all, then the famine arose. If he didn't spend all his money, he would have been able to make it through the famine. Okay, okay now that, that's a whole nother lesson. Okay, see, we got to do the natural and let God do the supernatural. Genesis 47 6, he says, the land of Egypt is before him. Pharaoh tells Joseph, the land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, Make thy father and your brothers to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any man, any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. He said, and so now Joseph picked this land out. He said, you can live anywhere you want. He said, okay, well, we, we got some cattle and we see that's a real uh, 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 fertile, prosperous land over there. He said, well, you can have it. And notice that Goshen is the best of the land. And so we need to understand that when we came into the kingdom of God, we don't just live in Fort Worth, Texas. You don't just live in Columbia, South Carolina. You don't just live in New York City. You don't just live in whatever city or, or town or municipality that you live. You live in the kingdom of God in that city. Oh, you can catch this. I don't live in Columbia, South Carolina, where I really don't literally even. I live right outside the city. But in my city, I don't just live in a, I live in the kingdom of God in that city. You got you to get this. You got to get this. Well, but this is happening in the city. Yes, but I live in the kingdom of God in that city. Which means things that work against them don't work against me. As a matter of fact, because I'm a kingdom citizen, I have something that they call diplomatic immunity. 
That means things that you charge other people with and that, and, and that affect them won't have to affect me because I'm in the kingdom of God. Y'all are listening to me here. Look at Deuteronomy 8. So God tells his people, he says, Deuteronomy 8, 7 and 8. He said, the Lord your God, he's going to bring you into a, what kind of land? A good land. It's a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. It's a land of wheat, of barley, of vines, of fig trees and pomegranates. It's a land of olive, of oil olive and honey. It's a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Now, some of y'all have eaten good all your life. I can look at you. But there's some of us who rejoice where I can eat bread without scarceness. Okay. See, I grew up, I grew up in a home with five kids. Unfortunately, there's only two of us left now. And I was the youngest. I grew up in a home where we used to try to hide stuff in the refrigerator. Now, y'all don't know nothing about that. You, you buy something and you try to put it in the back behind something because you don't want your brothers or sisters to get it. And, the, and then, then when, then when they, you were, who, who ate my sandwich? Who drank my Coke? Everybody's quiet because we didn't eat without scarceness. We had some scarcity, okay? And, and you know, I, I, tried, I brought that, I didn't know any better. I brought that into my home with, with my family, with my children. My, my, who drank, my, my wife said, now you need to understand something here. She said, I know that's how you were raised, but in this house, everybody can eat anything. I'm like, they don't work. They don't have, those kids don't have no job. God said, you're going to be able to eat without scarceness. No scarcity. Okay, I'm going to go deeper. I'm going to see, for, for people who have, a, who have a background like me, who, who can identify with this, you're not just going to eat flakes. You're going to eat Kellogg's. <laughs> Frosted flakes. Oh, what you talking about? You're not just going to have cola. You're going to have Pepsi Cola. Some of y'all don't know there is a difference. When we started out, my, my wife used to go shopping and I would see name brands. I said, well, who, what, why'd you buy this? Why don't you get the Kroger brand? Why don't you get the Food Line brand? No, we, we can't afford that. And I had to change my whole mentality. God wants you to eat without scarceness. Look at this. Thou shalt not lack what? Anything in it. The land that God brings you into is a land of no scarcity. It's a land that we're not supposed to lack anything in it. And it's a land of whose stones are iron, out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. Look, look at your neighbor and say, can you dig it? Can you dig it? See, he said, we live in a kingdom and there are things in the kingdom because you're in the kingdom in a good land. There's brooks of water, there's fountains, there's depths and there's valleys. There's things that's just going to come to you just because you're in the kingdom. There's things that's just going to flow to you just because you're in the kingdom. He said, but there's a few more of you who are willing to dig for a little bit more. And if you dig it, you can have more. I thank God for all the stuff that just flows, but I thank God that I learned that I live in a kingdom where I can dig some brass. Come on, if you're willing to dig it, you can have more. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what your skin color is. I don't care wh whether you're born in the city or in the country. If you are willing to dig for it, you can have more because God going to get in your digging. God will show you where to dig. God will make your digging prosperous. Somebody ask somebody again, can you dig it? He said, you'll be able to dig brass. And then verse 10, he says, when thou hast eaten and are full, not if you get full. When? God said, because you were in this good land, because you're in Goshen, because you're in the kingdom of God, there's going to come a day you have no lack in your life. You will have eaten and you are full. Then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Now, so, so listen, I, I know it's a whole lot of y'all. You got generations of wealth. I got new money. I got new money. And I can't forget where God brought me from. But I thank God that lack is something in my past. 
Every day I look in the rearview mirror and lack are getting further and further from me. Oh my God. I remember when, but God has brought me into a good land. It's a land that flows with milk and honey where you won't lack any good thing. So there was a time I was believing God, I would send all my children to college debt free. Well, I did that. Now I said, God, who else you want me to help? What other children you want me to help, help, help to go to school debt free? Thank you, Lord God, my, that, that, that my, all my housing bills are paid. God, who else can I help that they can come to the place that you brought me? Because God wants you to have flow and overflow. It was probably, it was probably 1985, something like that. My wife and I, we had just gotten married and my needs had needs. And I remember I had just got finished praying. I said, Lord, all I ask you that I can just pay my bills. Okay, come on, in, in, come on, be honest. Any of y'all ever prayed that in the past? I know you know better. You've been listening to Ken Copeland now. I know you know better than that. But you used to pray that, God, all I want you is pay my bills. I, was, I just got finished praying that. I said, God, I just want to pay my bills. I turned the TV on and Brother Copeland's on, on television. He says, some of you are saying all I need is enough to pay my bills with your stingy self. I said, he said, well, if you, all you have enough to do is pay your bills, how are you going to bless somebody else? You ought to believe God that all your bills are paid and then you can help pay somebody else's bill. I never heard that before. What type of man is this? This must be a cult. But I had to change my mentality and realize in the kingdom, I'm not supposed to have lack. One of the things I confess in our church, the Bible says, when there shall be no poor among you. When there shall be no poor among you. It said there shall be no barren among you. We curse barrenness in our church. We have a ministry that does nothing but pray with women who are struggling in the birthing process. And we believe, and over the years, and we've been doing this now for, I don't know, seven or 10 years, we got at least 25, 30 babies in our church that people, where people told those parents, you will never have children, that something's wrong. Oh, but we believe there will be no barren among us. I know it's hard to believe this, but every now and then, pe people bless us with cars, and so we, can, we, we try to give cars away in our church. Well, if you're a member of the right direction and, and, you, and you need a car, we got a car we can give you. Now, in the average church, folks would be lining up. We take weeks. Anybody need a car? I said, need a car. I, was, I said, I would say, anybody need a car? And people say, well, Pastor, I got one car. I can sure use another one. I said, that's not what I said. Well, sure, well what, what year is this car, Pastor? Because I want a newer car. I said, anybody need? We couldn't find anybody in our church who needed a car. We had to look outside of our church just to give away a car. God will bring you to a place that there's no lack among you, no poor among you, no barren among you. I declare in my household, the Bailey family, there will never be poverty ever again. We came from that, never going back. So we got to teach our kids, you got to watch who you're married because they got a poverty spirit on them. You don't want to bring that up in here. Oh boy, let me move on. Goshen had divine protection from plagues. When God sent the plagues upon Egypt, he protected and spared his people in Goshen. Exodus 8, 22 and 23. God said, and I will sever, which means to set apart, separate, separate, and distinguish in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end that thou mayest know, I'm going to let you see and confirm that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Exodus 8, 23, watch this. And I will put a division <laughs> between my people and thy people. 
And tomorrow, uh, sound like he picked a date. And tomorrow shall this sign be. He said, tomorrow you're going to see the difference between the kingdom citizens and the non-kingdom citizens. Tomorrow you're going to see the difference between covenant people and non-covenant people. Tomorrow you're going to see a difference between believers and unbelievers. Tomorrow you're going to see a difference between the saints and the ain'ts. God said, I'm going, to, I'm going to distinguish. In the land of Egypt, you're going to see there's something special about being in my family. There's something special about being the seed of Abraham. Well, I'll bless those that bless you and curse them that curse you. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. And we are Abraham's seed. So watch this. So, Goshen, when the plagues came, Goshen had no hell. Now, hell is a crop destroyer. Exodus 9 chapter, verse 20 and 21. It says, he that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. Verse 21, and he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. Now, God said, listen, I'm getting ready to destroy everything that lives. He said, now get all your stuff, bring it in the house. Do, do you know, even in the kingdom of God to this day, there can be prophetic words coming. People that I don't believe that. Okay, well, the hell going to hit your house. Believe the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Are y'all listening to me here? He says, and so some people say, well, I don't believe, I don't believe that. I don't, I don't believe taking communion do anything. In the midst of this pandemic, and some people say, I, I wouldn't say that if I were you. Well, you're not me. Those who have the God kind of faith call those things that be not as though they were. Come on, if you don't believe it enough to say it, you really don't believe it. Let me say it again. If you don't believe enough to say it, you really don't believe it. So in the midst of this pandemic, I was one of the first people who, 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 got, who got the virus back in March of, of last year. Went to New York to see my daughter like I'm flying out this afternoon to do and came back. And, uh, and, and then she came home from the epicenter of the world, New York City. Showed up at the house. Next thing I know, she got the virus, I got the virus. I was in the midst of preaching a series called My Spiritual Immune System. And the devil tried to say, oh, you got a spiritual immune system, huh? Well, let's see about this. But I stood on the word. Come on, watch this. I went through that thing when they didn't know what to do and everybody was praying. And I had everybody praying with me. And, and, and I got back in my pulpit about three weeks later saying, like I said, I said, I have a spiritual immune system. And we stood on the word of God that there will be no plague in our dwelling. So th 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 this is what I got to say to you. So, so the Lord gave me straight, he said, take communion every service. Now as custom, you know, in our tradition of our church, we would take communion on the first Sunday. But the Lord said, every time you get together, take communion. Even when we didn't have anyone in the building. My, we, we just, just with my skeleton crew and I told everybody, every, everybody to, to, to get elements at home or whatever. And so some people said, I said, take pictures. Some people said, well, I, Pastor, I got my Coke and chips. I said, that ain't communion. <laughs> get yourself some bread and some juice, you know, you know. And so we took communion. Watch this. Out of thousands of people, now we had several people contract the virus. Thank God in 18, 19 months of this, of this virus, we have had not one die connected with our ministry. I, I said we're taking communion every service. We're going to declare the blood of Jesus. Come on. We're going to be under divine protection. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And I'm sure there's some people say, I don't believe that. God said, bring all the stuff in the house because I'm about to send the play. Drop, drop down to verse 23. Exodus 9, and Moses stretched forth his rod toward the heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along upon the ground. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. But here we go. 
verse 24, so there was hell and fire mingled with the hell, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. But keep on going down to verse 25. And the hell smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all the land that was in the field, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hell smote every herb of the field and break or broke every tree of the field. Oh, but verse 26, only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hell. Will somebody say there will be no hell? Who no oh, glory to God in my land. Hell is a crop destroyer. Hell is a property destroyer. Oh, but we are in the kingdom of God. We have a promise of divine protection, not all over our lives, but over our stuff. Oh, come on. Yeah, I believe. Do you really believe that stuff? That's why I'm preaching it, because I believe it, and I live it every day. Now, let me start wrapping this up here. So in Goshen, they had light when everybody else had darkness. Exodus 10 Verse 21 through 23, and the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven. There's going to be darkness over the land of Egypt. Darkness which, which may be felt. Boy, that, every time I read that scripture, I want to shiver. It said darkness that may be ooh, felt. That's some scary darkness right there. He said not darkness you see, darkness that you feel. <laughs> it, it, this, this is going to be terrorizing. He said, there's going to be darkness which may be felt, verse 22. And Moses stretched forth his hand towards heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. Verse 23, they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. Uh-oh, 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 but here, here come the kingdom people. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwelling. <laughs> Will you give God praise that we still got light when the world has darkness? that we still have light when they don't know what to do. We still have wisdom when they're confused because we have the kingdom advantage. So when it's dark in the world, God promised there'll always be light in the kingdom. Psalms 112 and 4, unto the upright there arises light in darkness. I don't care what you're going through, I came to prophesy to somebody that receive it, light's about to show up. You're about to see your way out. God's going to show you what to do. God is illuminating your darkness. He said he is gracious, full of compassion and righteous. And we all know this one. Isaiah 60. I'm about to close here, but I think I want to preach a little bit before I close. Isaiah 60 says, arise and shine. For your light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen up on thee. Every time I see that word upon, I break it up. Up on. God's glory is up on me. I declare God's glory is up on you. You can't, you can't lose with the stuff we use because God's glory is up on you. Wealth and riches is up on you. Healing is up on you. Prosperity is up on you. Somebody shout, it's up on me, it's up on me. Oh my God, my, oh my God. I got it on me, I got something on me. Some of us, we look over it, but when that man who was lame at the temple, he came in, he looked at Peter and John and he's wanting to receive something from them. And Peter and John said, listen, we don't have no money on us right now. We know they have some money. He said, we don't have any money on us right now. He said, but watch this, he said, look on us. Look, look what? There's something upon me. There, there's something upon me. The glory of the Lord is upon me. You can hate me, but that's all right. That don't change the glory from being up on me. You can try to stop me, but that's all right too. You can't stop me because God's glory is up on me. I have the kingdom advantage. He said, watch this, verse 2, for behold, darkness is going to cover the earth and gross darkness is going to cover the people. There's going to be pandemics, there's going to be plagues, there's going to be global warming, there's going to be this, there's going to be that, everybody's going to be looking sad, but the Lord shall arise upon thee 
and his glory shall be seen upon you. Listen, watch this. My, my, my bank, when, when, they, when they looked at our fine, they said, I don't understand this. I don't, I don't, I, they said, oh, you sure are smart. Oh, you're such a, it must be your business background. You all know, I know it's God's glory upon us that kept us thriving when other folks are trying to survive. When I don't know what to do, he still knows what to do, and I tap into the wisdom of God, and I come out with confidence. This is what we're going to do. This is where we're going to go. This is where we're going to sow. We were getting ready to build a, getting ready to build a seven, at that time of 17 million. We've changed it now. And so my wife is preaching for one of the largest churches here in this city. And uh, as she's preaching, they, they were receiving the offering. The pastor said, we're, we're, getting, we're getting ready to pay off 17, 17 million dollars of debt. Praise God. And, and now we're at that. And the Lord said, you need to get in on that. On. Yeah. Now, watch this. I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly connected with him like that. The Lord said, you need to get in on that. I contacted my sister. I said, we're going we're gonna to sow into that. And uh, uh, we're, we're going to sow something that represents because where you are is where I'm going. Say this with me. Say, don't hate, don't hate. Congratulate, congratulate, and participate, and participate. but don't hate. don't hate. You can't hate the blessed and expect to be one of us. You can't hate on the rich and then expect to be one of us. And so, Lord, and so I contacted him and I said, listen, I'm going to sow, we're going to sow $17,000 to help. He said, oh, you don't have to do that. I said, no, I don't have to do, I don't have to do, but I'm doing what the Lord, Lord told me to do. And he had, been saying for, he had been saying for several years, because he's a noted pastor and, a, and a, one of our dignitaries in the city and state, he said, we've been, we, 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 when are we going to have lunch? Well, after he got that, he said, call me, let's have lunch. <laughs> All of a sudden, manifestation came. He said, well, I want to take the lunch. Where would you like to go? Well, if you want to give me, if you want to try to reciprocate for $17,000, we ain't going to McDonald's. <laughs> Meet me at Ruth Chris. But we work these principles, and every time we have a need, it shows up. Because I, I, I did, this is a whole series that I did. But you know what I'm saying? The kingdom works by principles. It doesn't work by magic. It doesn't work by just hook a Messiah. It works by principles. When we follow the principles of God's word, we won't lack anything. Those who fear the Lord will not lack any good thing. Come on, stand with me this morning. I want to pray over you. Father, I thank you today for everyone under the sound of my voice. Those here in this convention center, as well as all those that are watching by streaming. Locally, around the world, various time zones, wherever they are. Thank you, Lord God, that even though we may be separated by oceans and waters, and geographically, we may be separated by bridges and tunnels. But if we are in the kingdom of God, there's one kingdom. Thank you, Father, that we experience all the kingdom benefits. In this world, there's going to be tribulation. But thank you, we're not just in the world. We're in you in this world. We're not just in the United States. We're not just in Europe. We're not just in Africa. We are in the kingdom of God in those countries and on those continents. So I thank you, Lord God, that you continue to show yourself strong for your people. You continue to show yourself strong for every church. You continue to show yourself strong for every family that would dare trust you in the midst of this world's pandemic. We say we're going to rise and shine for our light has come and the glory of the Lord is up on us. And you said that the Gentiles, those that don't know God, they're going to come to our light. And when they come to our light, we'll be able to lead them to Jesus Christ. Because we are the salt of the earth. We're cities set upon hills that cannot be hid. So God, we take none of your glory. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we remember the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous, we run into you. And in the midst of this pandemic, we are safe. We are safe. We are safe. And if you believe that, give God praise for it. Hallelujah. I love y'all.